Thank you. Yeah, we're good. May I have a motion to return the regular board meeting to public session? Uh, thank you, Dr. Lippman. Ms. Pullen, second. All in favor? Moving on. Thank you. All hands up equals unanimous. I call the regular board meeting to order. All board members are present except for Mr. Viscalia. Ms. Pullen, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be advised that in the event of a fire emergency and an evacuation should be necessary, an alarm will sound. Please note all marked emergency exits and evacuate well away from the building. At this time, we request that everyone please turn their cell phones and other electronic devices to silent. Is there a motion, please, to approve the agenda as presented? Thank you, Mrs. Van Sys and Mrs. Beeger, second. All in favor? Unanimous, thank you, motion carries. All right, we now have recognition and board acknowledgements. Dr. Brown Hall, I turn it over to you. Thank you very much, President Leatherborough. So tonight we continue our school spotlight, highlighting the great work that goes on within our school buildings. This month, our school spotlight focuses on Dodge Elementary and Heim Elementary. First, I'd like to welcome up principal extraordinaire, Charlie Smilnich, the principal of Dodge Elementary, to share more about a student-inspired kindness challenge that has impacted the school community. I'll talk first. Originally, when this first started, Morgan started all of this. So instead of me explaining what it is, she's going to explain what her challenge is, what it did in the spotlight for Dodge Elementary. So I'm not going to steal her thunder, and she's going to present on behalf of Dodge today. All right. Thank you. Daddy. The idea came from a writing unit last year in first grade about persuasion. I thought I could come up with easy ways for people to be kind. It turned into a month-long challenge, just showing everyone it doesn't cost anything to be kind. And also, that kindness is contagious. This year, my saying was, make kindness effortless. And I think Dodgers did just that. My hope is to keep the kindness challenge going for many, many years. Turn on the video, Mr. Nick. Morgan created the Kindness Challenge for the month of March. There are things that happen here at school. There are things that happen at home. And when they complete the 30 challenges, we ask them to turn that in so we can recognize everybody for all the kindness that they've done in the month of March. I wrote down a lot of things that people could do to be kind, and then um, it turned into uh, 30 days, and then we asked if we could make the whole entire school do it. Even before she came to talk to me, she thought about how she wanted this to grow and reach all the kids at Dodge. Morgan is focused on kindness all the time, reaching out to friends who need her, but this is really important. This comes from Morgan's heart because she wants to expand kindness and make sure that it's important to everyone, just like it's important to her. One of the challenges in the 30 days of kindness was to make a donation to the SPCA. This one really meant a lot to the kids. They were excited to do something to help animals. We were really overwhelmed with the donations that kids and families have brought in. I think it's really nice because it's helping the dogs and cats. The best part about being kind is that everybody shares things and they're all nice. It makes me feel good to have the kindness challenge because then um, lots of people are spreading kindness and everyone's being kind to each other. Holding doors for people, giving compliments, being kind to strangers because it could spread kindness to everyone when you do it. We have been overwhelmed by how many kids took on this challenge and um, it goes beyond things that kids do in their day-to-day -day lives so it wasn't just easy things. They've really challenged themselves to be more kind this month. 
This is student-led, empowered by a second grader that's really spread throughout our school. What we've learned from Morgan is saying is not just doing. You have to do it and you have to live it day by day, every single day to be kind to all. It's beyond my words to say how proud I am of her and our school for participating in doing this. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. Morgan, thank you very much. And I really like that. You said make kindness effortless. Yeah. I like that. Awesome. Thank you very much, Morgan. And Principal Smilnix, thank you very much also. Thank you. Morgan, would you like to get a picture with Superintendent Brown Hall? Your sister can come up. Your sister can come up too. That sounds like a good idea. Okay. Yeah, bring him up. Okay. Hey, Morgan. Yep. Okay. Great Next, I'd like to bring up another phenomenal principal, Dr. Bonnie Stafford, principal at Heim Elementary, to join us and provide insight into their RISE initiative, R-I-S-E, which is dedicated to recognizing students. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on behalf of Heim Elementary School. Um, our video tonight is showcasing our RISE program, which stands for Recognizing and Inspiring Student Effort. We've been putting a huge emphasis and focus on social emotional skills at Heim Elementary School, especially over the course of the past couple of years as we've been trying to navigate through this pandemic. And our RISE initiative has been part of that focus. So we hope you enjoy it. Thank you. RISE stands for Recognizing Inspiring Student Effort. But it's a nice opportunity to reward kids for being kind, for being helpful, for having some perseverance and difficult situations for themselves, whether that be academically, socially, or behaviorally. And it's not a competition. It really is just kind of lifting everybody up and really showing the extra effort. And I think that's the part we're really looking for. When the teacher recognizes you doing something amazing, he or she gives you this award. I love congratulating people when they get one, and all of every and all my classmates were congratulating me too. So it's really fun to like just say like congratulations, that was amazing. I got three rise awards. What did you do to get that? Picking garbage off the floor, giving other friends compliments playing with people, makes me feel good. It makes me feel really great because that means that the teachers know that I'm working hard. Kids should do good things and be good in general because it helps the community and it makes you and the other person feel great. I've seen kids that are reaching out to help other kids who are not included. Um, really helping kids to show some kindness. I think they're getting an opportunity to really show all of their attributes, not just how they're doing in math or social studies, but also just how they are improving as a human being and really showing social emotional growth. It's very important for us that our students know that we're proud of them and that we notice their efforts. By recognizing them with a RISE Award, it hopefully helps them feel proud and appreciated and also motivated to continue those efforts. We've seen an increase in empathy between students, just kind of giving them that little extra boost that they need to turn their day around. I'm always proud of our kids. It's just, it's a great place to be.
Thank you, Principal Stafford. Two great school spotlights. I'll turn it back over to you, President Leatherboro. Okay, are there any board acknowledgements tonight? Dr. Littman. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, commend generically all of the students uh, who have been involved in all the musicals and all of the performances, but I did attend uh, last month at North uh, Joseph and the amazing Technicolor mm -hmm. Dream. Oh, yes. And it was just so phenomenal. The, you know, the quality of the performance, as well as the quantity of participation of students who were on stage, who were uh, in the orchestra pit, who were there just to help people and guide people. And it was just a very pleasant experience. So again, I commend all of our students at all of the high schools for their performances. Thank you, Dr. Lippman. Anybody else? Vice President Van Seis. Just quickly, I would like to also recognize the SIAC, which is the Superintendent Inner High Advisory Council. Just for the creativeness and the new initiatives that we saw, they had a spirit week, the three high schools, right before the spring recess, um, where one of the days was anything but a backpack, and they were extremely creative. It just fostered this new sense of hope and camaraderie with each other. And then I know they also are having a mentor, a mentoring program that's going to be taking place too. So just like Morgan from Dodge and seeing Heim, all of these wonderful student-driven initiatives that are really focusing on our social-emotional wellness, it's fabulous to see. So i just like to recognize that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Giger. Just wanted to mention also um, the Painted Bird, the world premiere, that mm. performance that we saw. Um, I know there were many people in attendance and perhaps some of you in the community that weren't able to attend saw some of the highlights that the district put out. It was so incredible to see all of our school ensembles play together, but then um, for our music department to put together a Williamsville wind ensemble and see kids from all three high schools playing together on a stage, playing music of that caliber, um, a composer and conductor of that caliber was really just something so special. So um, I'd like to acknowledge everyone involved in making that happen. It was truly a wonderful, wonderful event. Thank you, Mrs. Speaker and Dr. Singh. Um, I just wanted to wish our community members from Southeast Asia who had the new year last week. And that was during the break. And I mean, there were a lot of celebrations in the local communities and I just wanted to wish them that. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Okay, I will turn it over to our parliamentarian to speak about public expression. Actually this evening, there is no one signed up for public expression. So I will turn it back over to you. All right, well, now we are on item number five, which is the review of our code of conduct. Dr. Brownhall, would you like to speak on that for us? Absolutely. So I encourage uh, everyone, community members, uh, parents, to really look at the code of conduct. This is the first uh, sitting of the code of conduct. It will not be voted on until the or adopted until the May meeting, which gives an, enough time for everyone to review. What I do want to point out is we really infuse, and I want to thank um, Assistant Superintendent Skanzuzo and the Wellness Committee for all the work they put into this and everyone's feedback and the restorative practices that are evident throughout. And it's really important on page 22 of the Code of Conduct, it says essential to the implementation of re restorative justice practices is helping students who have engaged in unacceptable behavior to understand why the behavior is unacceptable and the harm it caused understand what could have been done differently in the same situation, take responsibility for their actions, make reparations and or restitution to repair the harm done, be given the opportunity to learn pro-social strategies and skills to use in the future, and understand the progression of more increasingly punitive consequences may be imposed if the behavior reoccurs. So that's the basis of restorative practices. And I'm glad that was infused in the code of conduct. So I encourage everyone to review it. And if you have any feedback, please let us know. Thank you very much. Does anyone from the board have any questions or comments for the superintendent regarding the code of conduct? Dr. McCleary. Just really quickly in terms of reading it, what I really personally liked, I guess it might not be the right phrase, but that the emphasis is certainly on the student and it talks about student rights, 
but it also talks about student responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important to note that indeed our students do have rights, but they also have responsibilities. Thank you for that, Dr. McClary. Any other comments or questions? Dr. No, I did send forward some information and, you know, again, just some things I would like to see in it that didn't seem to show up that other districts have <laughs> is information about uh, alternative instructions for students who have been suspended or outside of class. Uh, the other issue I had in my mind uh, was about um, some of the definitions, use the definition, I'll use the term and the definition when it would just need a little clarity, but I gave you that information. Yep. The other is about data collection. Uh, you know, I think there needs to be something in there about when we, uh, when a student, uh, you know, has an issue that causes an issue in the code of conduct, that uh, that data is compiled and that we make sure that we see it. Uh, I know the state does that, but I'm, you know, again, at our level, uh, you know, it's my first year back, so. Uh, I can speak I to that last comment because that's actually something the board requested about two years ago. And so now at the end of the year, okay. Um, I believe it's the end of the year, is it the fall? It's the end of the discipline report. Yeah. Yeah, so yes. we get a cumulative discipline report and <clears throat> we're able to see um, a breakdown by building of yes. all the different infractions, if you will. That's great. The code of conduct, because we have to, and I agree with you to that point, you know, we asked for that because we wanted to have some data to show is this code of conduct working for our students in our, in our buildings? That's perfect. That's Thank what we you. have. And um, to you. your point to Dr. McCleary, the code of conduct is in effect for students. It's also in effect for all staff, all employees, all parents, and all visitors. And that's in buildings and on district property or school-sponsored events. Okay. Any final questions from the board? Mrs. Beaker. Yeah, my comment is just um, in appreciation for the restorative practices that have been added to this. Um, I, I think it, uh, it is timely. We've asked questions about that before to see the work that's gone into it. Not only is, is uh, the idea of restorative practices defined in, in the document, um, but it's really well structured. You can see the tier one, two, and three so that, you know, um, it starts proactively for everyone with community circles, but that for students that are are um, have these infractions that we see that there's learning that comes from it and not just a, um, you know, a suspension, but a piece where they learn from that. So hopefully that doesn't continue. I think it's an excellent addition and uh, I really appreciated what I saw in the document. So thank you for the work that went into this, the whole committee. Um, it, this isn't just a district document, but from what I read, there's, there's parents, there's students, there's um, employees that, you know, it, it looks like a really nice piece of work from a, a lot of stakeholders so mm -hmm. thank you for the time that went into this it looks great yeah. all right so now we're on 5b so at this time the board welcomes anyone in attendance tonight who wishes to speak about the code of conduct to the podium at this time and if you do come to the podium to speak on the code of conduct please state your name for the record All right, so I don't see anyone, so we will move along. We are on item six, which is the approval of our consent agenda items seven, eight, and nine. May I please have a motion to approve the consent agenda items seven through nine, please, at this time. Thank you, Dr. McClary and Ms. Kazmarek Bogner. Thank you as our second. Any questions or comments for the superintendent? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed or abstentions, motion carried unanimously. The Board of Education extends best wishes and gratitude to the following retirees for their service to the district. Jane Lorenz, Transit Middle School, 32 years of service. Judith Castine, Transit Middle School, 20 years of service. Ronald Evans, South High School, 30 years of service. Mary Beth Gunther, Dodge Elementary, 31 years. Diane Pecorero, Casey Middle School, 23 years of service. Kelly Simmons, Transit Middle School, 29 years of service. And Gail Sterling, Country Parkway, 34 years of service. Thank you so much for your service and enjoy your retirement. Thank you. 
Item 10 A and B is there a motion to approve the minutes from the March 8th board meeting and agenda item 10A and from the March 22nd budget work session in item 10B. Thank you, Dr. Lippman. You have a second, please. Ms. Poulin, thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there any corrections to the minutes? Mrs. Beeger? Yeah, I'm just wondering if we can separate the items. Oh, uh, sure. 10A and B. Take 10A separately. So any questions or comments on 10A? All right, all approval for 10A. Opposed? Abstentions? Okay, motion carries 710. Or 701, sorry about that. Thank you. And on 10B, all in favor? Or I'm sorry, actually a motion for 10A or 10B. Mrs. Beeger and then Dr. Lippman. Any <coughs> corrections on 10B? Thank you, all in favor. Opposed? Abstentions? That one carries unanimously, thank you. Thanks. All right, moving on to our president's report for events. There are a list of upcoming and past events in board docs. We had one teacher visit us at East this month during the community, um, or I'm sorry, conversations with staff listening session. And she was advocating for a review book for the students to prepare for the earth science exam. I put that in my report to the board. Thank you to all the stakeholders who participated in our spring community forum. And does anyone from the board wish to make a comment about any past or future events? All right, thank you. So I won't go through all of them, but they are there listed for your review. All right, policy reading item B. So I'm bringing back uh, policy 3281 for consideration. This was just previously reviewed during the 3000 level series. It lists the Boy Scouts of America um, and I would like the Girl Scouts to receive equal recognition and consideration in the title and wording. So if you take a look in board docs, uh, huh? District Clerk Lynn Carey has already stated how she would just correct that. It's basically a simple correction to the title and then just mm -hmm. making sure Girl Scouts is included in the language. So at this time, may I have a motion to edit the title and wording of policy 3281 to include the Girl Scouts of America. Thank you, Vice President Van Sys and Ms. Poulin. Any questions or comments on that? Seeing none, all in favor? All hands up equals motion carried unanimously. Thank you. And, um, oh, you know what? I forgot to put on here, but since we're on policy review, our superintendent did indicate that we are able to start a review process for the next set of policies, which is the 4,000, and that's administration, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I believe that we had a few board members that offered to participate. So if you can refresh my memory who you were, because I think I've forgotten who you are. <coughs> so Ms. Pullen, Ms. Kazmarek Bogner, and Dr. McClary. So why don't we just make that official and approve uh, them here at the table tonight? That way they can begin scheduling for their meeting. And I believe it's only going to take them one session to do this. One. Mm -hmm. All right. So may I have a motion to please approve Ms. Pullen, Ms. Kazmir Bogner, and Dr. McClary to be on the committee to review the 4,000 level policies. Thank you, Mrs. Beeger. And thank you, Dr. Littman. All in favor? All hands up equals motion carried unanimously. So that is included on policy review. I'm sorry I forgot that, Mrs. Carey, but I'm glad that Sarah is a placeholder. All right, so after that is um, taken care of, then we can work on the the, on the 5,000s. We'll, we'll go one at a time because they're a little bit more specific mm -hmm. and um, we wanna make sure that we're consulting with the appropriate uh, staff and administrators, mm -hmm. excellent. All right, let's take a look at um, item C, there are events listed in board docs, including mandatory training for newly elected candidates. Does anyone have anything to add under Erie County Association of School Boards? All right, thank you. Item D, 
There's an upcoming event. Um, it's a virtual policy issues workshop. It's on May 11th for New York State School Board Association. Is there anyone at this time that would like to commit to that? If so, you can always contact uh, Lynn Carey and she will register for you. And there's also information about um, another opportunity to receive the board governance training for newly elected board members. You can either do that through the Erie County Association of School Boards or you may do that through NISBA. So that information is in our packet as well. The district clerk can manage those registrations. Does anyone have anything to report under NISBA? Ms. Pullen. I, I did just this afternoon actually receive an email regarding um, advocacy and there's a packet there which I will review and send on to everyone. If we should desire to put forward a policy to be included in the voting next fall, we will need to do that by August. So that gives us, I think, plenty of time to review that, but I will forward that to everyone. Um, if not this afternoon, do not want to get home tonight, tomorrow, so thanks. That's the resolutions for the convention? Yes. Okay, wonderful, thank you so much. That's really nice to you. Yep, absolutely. Great, we're on item E. So if we would please take a look at the draft Board of Education meeting calendar listed in there for your review. We are not approving it at this time, but I just want to make sure everyone has a chance to look it over. For those um, individuals who are now official candidates, or um, please also look at those dates, get them in your calendar so that you'll be ready to go. Are there any questions or comments regarding any of those dates. I did notice um, the October meeting is the day after the holiday. And I just wanna make sure that that's okay. <coughs> it's right after um, the, Columbus the Columbus Day break. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right. Today is after the spring break. Oh, that's break. true. Today is after the spring break. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, Go on. All right, we just keep rolling along. <laughs> Item F, is there a motion to approve and authorize the district clerk to hire election personnel to facilitate the annual district vote, which will be held on May 17th, 2022, as presented? All right, Vice President Van Sias, thank you. Mrs. Beeger, second. Any discussion on that? Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed or abstentions? All right, motion carries unanimously. At this time, I invite our district clerk, Lynn Carey, to share information on board candidates and the annual vote. Thank you, President Leatherbarrel. Uh, so this evening at 5.30, we did draw for uh, ballot placement. Um, Stuart Bulin um, is first, Teresa Ann Leatherbarrel second, Matthew Rigi, third, Christina Blackinger, fourth, and Jessica Fascalo is fifth. Um, next up for them is the candidates night, which is seven till nine o'clock on May uh, 11th. And it is optional, but mostly everyone attends that. Um, district vote is May 17th from 7 a.m. till 9 p.m. North High School gym. And for the vote in board docs, there is voter information there. Uh, the application for absentee ballot is also information. You have to email me. Just put, if you're emailing me, put application uh, in your header, in the subject line. And they're also available at um, district office for those who uh, would like one. And uh, there is... Uh, concern of exposure to COVID-19 is one of the marks you can you can check if you're concerned about that uh, for your application. Any questions from anyone? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Perry. Would someone like to make a motion, please, to resolve that upon the recommendation of the superintendent of schools, the Williamsville Central School District Board of Education adopts the proposed Erie 1 BOCES administration for the 2022-2023 year in the amount of 
$3,746,643 as presented. This is the approval of the Erie One BOCES budget. Thank you, Dr. McClary and Ms. Kazmarek Bogner. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Oh, sorry, I have to do Carrie's a going call. to take a roll call vote. <laughs> Okay, Dr. Singh, just reply yes or no. Dr. Singh? Yes. Dr. McClary? Yes. Vice President Van Seis? Yes. President Leatherbarrow? Yes. Ms. Kazmuzak Wogner? Yes. Ms. Beeger? Yes. Ms. Poulin? Yes. Dr. Lippman? Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right, and at this time now, we will also vote on the Erie One BOCES board member election. So in past meetings, we nominated individuals. Mrs. Carey will also be taking a roll call vote after board members cast a vote for the candidate. So would someone from the board like to make a motion to resolve to cast one vote in the annual election of three members for the Board of Education of the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, otherwise known as BOCES, first supervisory district. So your motion will just be for the individual that you wish to put forward. Dr. McClary? Um, yes, I would like to um, resolve to cast one vote for Mr. Mark Mecca, located in the Williamsville Central School District to serve as a trustee for the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, first supervisory district of Erie County in a term beginning July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2025. Thank you. A second. Do you need a second? Yes. Dr. Lippman is our second. All right. And Mrs. Carey, would you like to do your roll call vote? I will do that. Uh, and again, respond yes or no, please. Uh, Dr. Singh? Yes. Dr. McClary? Yes. President Van Seis? Yes. Vice President Van Seis, sorry. Yes. President Latherbarrow? Yes. Ms. Kazma Zach Brogner? Yes. Mrs. Beaker? Yes. Ms. Poulin? Yes. And Dr. Lippman? Yes. Thank you. All right, is there anyone else from the board that wishes to put forward a nominee? Mrs. Beeger. Yes, please. I would like to resolve to cast one vote for Mr. Eric Borenstein, located in the Lanesville Central School District, to serve as trustee for the Board of Cooperative Educational Services, first supervisory district of Erie County in a term beginning July 1st, 2022 through June 30th, 2025. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Vice President Van Size. Roll call vote. Uh, Dr. Singh? Yes. Dr. McClary? Yes. Vice President Van Size? Yes. President Leatherbarrow? Yes. Mrs. Kazmarek Brogner? Yes. Mrs. Beaker? Yes. Ms. Poulin? Yes. And Dr. Lippman? Yes. Thank you. Are there any further motions? All right. Seeing none. We are moving on to item 12, which is our superintendent's report. So Superintendent Brown Hall, I turn it over to you, sir. Thank you very much, President Leatherborough. So we'll do our community update. And with the community update, uh, part B is the update on the status of the district technology implementation. There'll be a brief video inside the community update, but I encourage everyone also to please look at 12B and board docs and the actual report is there. It does highlight the 22-25 instructional technology plan, um, highlights from there. It also talks about other major technology initiatives in the district, and it provides a comprehensive summary, also detailing the number of Chromebooks we have and the number of Chromebooks we will reach to, the number, what that will be, and what it will look like in elementary, middle, and high schools. Community update. So I know anyone that has been at uh, the meetings or looked at the YouTube meetings know about the proposed budget. Our Assistant Superintendent of Finance, Tom Matursky, has done a great job reviewing this with us, but we do have a balanced budget for the 22-23 school year of $212,528,086. So it ensures that all instructional programs are maintained and the proposed tax levy of 2.55% is below the New York State tax cap. 
elementary school building air conditioning capital project. Mr. Maturski has also spoke extensively about this. This has been reviewed also, but we want to make sure that it's fresh in everyone's mind. It's a $64.1 million capital project to provide air conditioning in our elementary schools. Information regarding the elementary school building air conditioning project, including an FAQ document and informational video is available on the district's website. So this is funded through debt borrowing, capital reserves, and budget appropriations. And it's really important that you know there's no tax increase with this $64.1 million capital project. Are we going to play a portion of that informational video, Nick? Thank you. The district recognizes the significant impact that the learning environment has on our youngest students. It is critical that these students begin their path to learning in a physical environment that presents them with the highest degree of success. This makes the elementary schools the logical starting point for a phased capital project approach. So you can watch the rest of the entire video on our website, just a little piece there. Like a little teaser. A little teaser, actually, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Board of Education Elections, I know that our district clerk, Lynn Carey, just spoke about this, but it is in the community update. So if anyone wants to reference it, you can either go back to the video. And um, our district clerk, Lynn Carey, was very eloquent at the podium, or you can just look it up in the community update here. Strategic planning. Buildings at this time are forming their school-based committees. We also created a short informational video to help guide the school-based committees on what will be expected of them when they form their committees. Parents submitted letters of intent to join the district-wide DEI committee. The first DEI committee meeting will take place in May. All the parents that are on the DEI committee district-wide were notified on Friday April 8th, before we left for spring break. And we will also be sharing information for parents to join the district-wide communications committee. That information will be shared in the weekly update this Friday. But for the schools, we actually created a short informational video to help guide them through their school-based committee. And so Nick's going to play a portion of that, the trailer for that right now. <laughs> the strategic plan is a guiding the strategic plan is a guiding document we are using to move our school community forward in the areas of communication, wellness, community, and sustainability, teaching, learning, and leadership, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. While we have district-wide goal statements and goal activities that have already been established, you might be asking, what work will we be doing in your schools as part of the building-based committee? The answer is simple. Work with your colleagues and committee members to develop and implement action steps to move the strategic plan and goals forward in your schools and departments in collaboration with the district while working under the direction of your building administration. Your work will help align and strengthen our buildings, district, and school community. Just a little trailer. So everyone else gets it when they form their committee yep. at the school. They'll be able to watch the entire thing. I want to also, again, at this time, thank everyone that was involved in the strategic plan development. It took a lot of work, a lot of meetings. I want to thank everyone that was involved in that. It will really move our district forward. Q rishing and cybersecurity. So this is something that Assistant Superintendent Scanzuzo came across. He shared it with us at our leadership team meeting, and it's really important, right? So QR codes are incredibly popular and easy to use. You see them everywhere nowadays, but it's difficult to determine whether a QR code is a fake. So how do we protect ourselves? So these are some of the tips they gave us is to add an antivirus, anti-malware software to mobile devices. Check the URL before allowing a QR code to open a browser to mitigate the risk of adverse consequences and training staff to be aware of the hazards of QR codes and also training students. So it came in handy also because, you know, I was in New York City over last weekend and many of the restaurants you sit down, you have to scan the QR code to get the menu. You want to make sure that it's a QR code from the restaurant or ask them to bring you a paper menu because it takes nothing for someone to come and slap a QR code there. You scan it on your phone and then it loads a virus to your phone. So be very careful of those. And so it's called q rishing And I thank Assistant Superintendent Scanzuzo for bringing that to our attention. So just be very mindful of those. I know a lot of kids are so used to scanning it, but we wanna just be very mindful of that. 
Um, I like to play Scrabble. So can I use Q Rishing as a word? You know what? I don't know if it's been adopted yet by Webster. <laughs> so we'll have to see if it's been adopted because you can only use the ones that Webster has adopted for Scrabble. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Absolutely. Technology integration with the report that is actually in Board Docs. We wanted to provide a, a small video also to show you how we have moved technology forward in the district. So as you can see from that video, our teachers and our students are doing phenomenal things with the use of technology in our district, and it will just get greater and greater as the school years progress. Really impressive. Regents exams. So the New York State Education Department plans to administer the Regents exams in June and August. So specific communications regarding the schedules and the exams will be forthcoming for middle and high school students. Middle schools will also receive additional communication from school buildings regarding the half days in June during exams. So please be sure to communicate with your schools also regarding transportation for Regents exams because transportation is available. Exams are June 1st, June 15th through the 17th. June Monday, June 20th is a Juneteenth holiday, so no exams that day, no school. Then exams continue June 21st through the 23rd. PTA, PTSA involvement. So as I continue to attend the PTA and PTSA meetings district-wide, I see what a staple the PTAs and PTSAs are in our buildings and what support they provide our schools. So I encourage parents to please remain involved. And I know we see a decrease in parent involvement as our students get older. I ask that you please, please, keep that level of support and involvement throughout your child's educational career. Um, PTAs and PTSAs allow for the flow of information to keep families informed. Their additional supports enhancing the educational experience. They provide an opportunity to present feedback to buildings. They are sponsoring so many school events I can't even name, and they provide a great vehicle for volunteer opportunities in our school. So please continue to support the PTAs and PTSAs in our schools and look to get involved. Superintendent Interhigh Advisory Council, I want to thank Van, Van, Vice President Van Sice. I, I like to buy a vowel. Vice <laughs> President Van Sice. Um, about her acknowledgement of the Superintendent Interhigh Advisory Council. So the Willpower Spirit Week was a great success. That was the week right before our spring break. So the first day is the tropical day. The day in the middle here is what 
Vice President Van Sice highlighted anything but a backpack day. And then there was another mix and match day, as you see highlighted in the third picture. Mm -hmm. So it was a great spirit week. And I want to thank our PTSAs because they actually donated gift cards so that there would be um, gift cards given for the students at each school that were voted to have the most spirit those days. So thank you very much for the PTSAs for those donations. So the SIAC mentoring program also is called Project Prepare, and seniors are mentoring juniors through the college planning process. It's really a if I knew then what I know now. So seniors who have gone through the college process, they're letting the juniors know, you know, what to look out for. If I would have known at the end of my junior year some highlights, this is what I want to share with you. So for additional information on Project Prepare, please reach out to the SIAC advisors at each of the schools, East, North, and South. And that is the end of the community update. I will ask at this time for uh, Dr. Marie Bell and our assistant superintendent, our chief academic officer, and our assistant superintendent of finance, Mr. Tom Matursky, to come up and give us a presentation on the federal grant relief information. <clears throat> Do you need the clicker? Oh, you're, oh, perfect. Thank you, Dr. Brown Hall. Thank you. Uh, we have a brief presentation, uh, and I'm going to begin, and then uh, Dr. Balin will take up um, a portion of it. Uh, so I'm going to begin with the information here regarding uh, our grants. And just a summary, um, in addition to the numbers here, you can see these are the dollar amounts that we were actually provided, approved, and awarded uh, for the, um, the ESSER II grant. Um, just some acronyms. We hear these acronyms all the time. Um, ESSER II actually re, uh, is Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief. Um, GEAR II, which we are hearing, is Governor's Emergency Education Relief. And if you really um, are unable to sleep at night and you hear CRRSA, <laughs> that is Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations. So with that, um, the last thing I want to say is these grants, as we knew from the beginning, they're multi-year grants. So that's how our budgets have been allocated to do this in a portion across number of years. And this particular, these two grants end on 930-2023. Um, our grant initiatives, um, you're going to hear us talk a little bit about these in this presentation. Um, the one thing I want to point out is that they must all align to what the state told us they, they had to achieve. Um, we did not need to achieve all of the items. We were able to select the items in the list that were pertinent to our district. So here's an example of some of the items that we um, have chosen to use these grant funds for ESSER II and GEAR II. Um, maintaining the continuity of our educational program. You can see the list of um, salary and benefits being a major one here. Steam supplies is another one you saw in that video. Um, technology on that side, Chromebooks. We were able to purchase a number of Chromebooks, um, handheld translators, digital platforms. Those are another few items. And then certainly some other initiatives, professional development. Dr. Balin will be talking a lot more about that. And supplies that support our instructional program um, as well as some for the grant, which is for um, going back a bit for the health and safety cleaning uh, solutions and items like that. I'm going to turn this one over to Dr. Balin. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the items that we uh, were fortunate enough to secure with the funding. Um, first and foremost, and we had mentioned this uh, way back when, when we were planning for summer school, that was actually one of the first items that we attended to with the grant money is supporting summer school salaries. We also, at that time, planned for some of our summer school resources. These included the teachers' college units of study materials, and we just listed some of those materials on the slide. Just as a reminder uh, for our audience, these are standards-based, research-based materials, and some of the items that are focused on with these materials include our comprehensive literacy skills, which are reading and writing, our phonics, um, using the workshop model, focusing on phonemic awareness, decoding, vocabulary, generating knowledge and comprehension. 
Um, it's a very comprehensive resource. Uh, what you've heard before about Teachers College holds true here as well. Uh, it offers many lessons, extensive video supports that are for students, teachers, and parents, trade books, and also quite a few downloadable uh, resources that can be accessed for teachers in the videos. Uh, and again, going back to uh, the next major grant we received, it's the American Recovery Plan, um, or ARP. And this was an interesting um, grant because it actually, the allocations changed from when we first were um, informed of them to what were uh, final allocations that were in November of 2021. Um, the other important thing to know is this is actually four separate grants. Each of these grants was applied for uh, in a separate manner, and they took through, although the approval process was similar, um, it was very um, detailed in what we needed to show and provide to New York State uh, to make these grants be approved. Again, the one thing I wanna note on here is the timeline. The ARP goes out one additional year, so it goes through 9-30-2024. And once again, uh, one of the things we wanted to ensure is that our grant, uh, any materials, resources, or plans for the grants, of course, had to adhere to the parameters and acceptable expenditures. What this required was a detailed review process by the New York State Education Department. So the grant application, questions, answers, responses, those were done so over a, quite a period of time with the reviewer. So it was a very extensive process, a very detailed process. So much of what you're going to see in the slides are really the content of what was shared back and forth with the state education department. Um, the grant activities listed on this slide are the ones that were matched to the allowable and ex uh, acceptable areas within the grant. So once again, uh, with ARP, we were again fortunate enough to include some of our summer materials there, which you saw some of our examples on the earlier slide. Um, these are the resources and grant items that were purchased with the ARP funding. And once again, our, our summer program was supported. In addition, we also had uh, funding for additional summer school salaries, and we also included technology in this case, which were our Chromebooks and software that were able to be utilized not just during the summer, but during the regular school year. So anytime you may have perused our hallways, what you may have seen were a lot of carts and a lot of uh, digital resources. Those up in uh, large fashion came from the, the grant money, so we were very fortunate to secure those. Um, and we also tied in back to the technology report that we had in one of our prior items. A lot of the usage there ties into um, making sure that our plan implementation is tied together with the COVID money. So they do go hand in hand. So we wanted to include also just uh, for your knowledge and our public as well, we've mentioned the learning lab multiple times uh, during the course of this year. This was one of the newer structures that we were able to implement as a result of the COVID funding. And in this case, uh, just as a reminder to all, this is a student support structure that we've addressed and it was based on student needs and circumstances really related to the grant purpose. So the bolded uh, items you see on the screen, particularly with the differentiated instruction, those are directly taken from the grant language. That is an item that is mentioned in the grant with re, uh, regard to learning. Uh, so we want to make sure, again, that that direct alignment was there. Um, we also included uh, informationally how students are identified and how they access the support for the program. Um, so this includes um, identification, certainly at the building level, by our teachers, by our counselors, and by our administrators. Um, our learning lab teacher also works hand in hand with other staff members in the building. And in addition, Students and parents also do provide information to the building regarding their needs, but the building does a great job working with parents to ensure that the best resources to meet the needs are paired with the needs. So it may be the learning lab, but it also may be one of the extensive other resource supports that we have in our district. So one of the new items I just want to take a moment to mention to you is uh, I've been working hand in hand with Dr. Brown Hall, and thank you to Mr. Filipowski. We have uploaded a document to our website. So this is publicly available under parents and students. There's actually a chart that shows really in large fashion, many of the supports we offer that are universally available to all of our students, 
as well as ones that are for targeted support for student needs. Those often are accompanied with links. You can click right on the name. It'll actually take you to either a board presentation or an area of our website. In addition, we included descriptions of some of the items. So there's a bit of a glossary in the back that tells you a little bit about what each structure is. We'll keep it dynamic as we need to add to it or edit it. That's what we'll do with the document, but it is also available for the public to see. So we wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to check that out because it's really a nice, uh, mm -hmm. nice tool. So just going back to the Learning Lab for a moment, um, wanted to also share with everyone what the focus of the Learning Lab is, what the students do, and it's very comprehensive. So one of the things we want to keep in mind is certainly there is an academic focus to the Learning Lab, but one of the things we talked about in the planning for the lab is we wanted to attend to the whole child. Certainly academics is always a focus of ours. It's always a great area of emphasis, but we wanted to make sure that several things were also embedded by design into the model. These include the things that you see currently on the screen here, but specifically, it's really ensuring that first and foremost, of course, that students are supported with any challenging concepts, skills, or any in some cases, catching up on missing assignments that they have. We all know that once we fall behind, it's very difficult at times to get our footing uh, back in place. So we want to make sure we had that just-in-time support for students to ensure that you get right back up and you keep moving forward. In addition to that, things like time management, perseverance, taking initiative, student self-advocacy, confidence, and all within a risk-free environment, having peer models, looking at models there when you're looking at your peers, individualized student success, reducing, of course, those missing or late assignments, increasing work ethic and classroom performance, and introducing organizational methods. This is a huge, huge piece of, again, making sure you're establishing a structure for yourself. So students, in many cases, are first and foremost creating an agenda or a to-do list. And at the end of class, they're reflecting on their progress. So structures are very important. So while again, there's that academic piece, as you can see, the, the focus extends to a lot of other areas. Um, again, one of the things we built in when we were giving the reviewers sort of our feedback and going back and forth are what kind of data and information we gather and we'll continue to monitor the program. Those are listed on the screen. As you can see, there are certainly quantitative data points that we are looking at like report cards and grades and certainly assignment completion, but also relative to the areas I mentioned, this is where student observation, reflection and feedback from staff, students and parents is critical. We need that qualitative information as well. So we are collecting that on an ongoing basis. We will also uh, be collecting a report from each building. This is at the middle and high school level, just to give a reminder. Each building will submit to me our feedback at the end of the year. We will debrief with the building leaders um, to review and revisit, make sure that our goals were attained and to what degree. Um, that will also help us move into next year and looking at the second year of the learning lab. It's very important to remember though, um, and I want to make sure we address this, is one big question would be, will this continue next year? It will continue next year. The grant is still active at that point, but just like any program that we have, and certainly one that was created under these conditions, this was created purposefully given the conditions we were in because of COVID. So I do want to remind too, one of the things that the Learning Lab really did a good job with is attending to students who were either quarantined or coming back from multiple day illnesses. So we had a lot of that, as we all know, given the past couple of years. So this last year has has had a lot of that as well. So that, that piece is uh, tremendously helpful and has been a, a, a good piece for us. So um, at this time, just so everyone is aware, um, we have received a lot of positive feedback on the Learning Lab. This is coming from all sources at this point, very positive. Um, the reflection from schools also indicates that today, and these are current numbers, um, we have over 550 students scheduled, and we also have drop-ins that aren't counted in that. So you can see the magnitude of the reach is vast, um, and it's making a difference for kids, and that's really the biggest accomplishment any one of us could ask for. So as I mentioned, we'll have our planned review and our revisiting, um, but we were clear with, with our intent when we planned the program and what, with what we were doing, why we were doing it, and what we were going to look at uh, on an ongoing basis. So um, I'm very proud of all the work that's been done and I thank everybody who's been involved. Um, at this time, we're gonna take a quick pause. Mr. Filipowski was uh, tremendously helpful in putting together a little video on the Learning Lab that will be part of what we share tonight, but will also be available to our public moving forward. So Nick, if you wouldn't mind.
The four main areas of focus in the Learning Lab are academic support, executive functioning, social emotional learning, and connecting with colleagues. In Learning Labs, students are provided with differentiated individual and small group lessons, supports, and assistance. Students are primarily recommended by their teacher or counselor based on identified need. The Learning Lab teacher works collaboratively with colleagues and other staff members to meet student needs. Let's take a look at academic support. Academic support in the Learning Lab is literally just the day to day. Do you have your homework finished? Let's make sure that you're up to date. Let's look ahead what tests you have to study for. So it's really just teaching the kids those basic skills of keeping up with their day-to-day -day work. For the students, it's, it's amazing how when someone is so far underwater, either they've been absent or they don't have structures in place, when they suddenly feel that they're above water and they're successful and they can look ahead, it's an amazing feeling for the kids. It's really empowering for them. And I even had a student recently say, well, since your room is right here, when I walk by from high school, will you still help me when I'm in high school? So they know that they need the extra help and they're happy to have it. And I'm teaching them the skills that they need to be successful later on. Next up, executive functioning. I think when you look at a learning lab, you want to address immediate needs for students, providing those academic supports. But when it comes to setting long-term goals for student success, you need to teach them transferable skills. And that's what one of the points is in incorporating executive functioning in the learning lab is these are skills that will serve students in the moment, but they will serve students in a variety of settings throughout their academic careers if they can master those skills now. It's a, a two-pronged approach. One is um, addressing student needs in the moment, um, but setting students up for future success. They are not always going to have a learning lab down the road to catch them uh, when they're struggling. So trying to teach them to fish, uh, to build those skills that they can rely on independently down the road is one of the outcomes that we're looking for. Now let's take a look at social emotional learning. So social emotional learning is like the foundation of a building and so if that foundation is strong then we know that we can build upon that foundation. So when we help students and support them and sometimes teach them how to um, be in touch with their emotions, express them in um, calm manners to teach other students how to respect that um, their classmates may have experiences different from theirs. We're providing a strong foundation that allows learning to happen. And so we've seen in Learning Lab all kinds of growth in students um, when they feel a part of a community, when they feel connected and they feel that their individuality is valued that allows them to focus on higher order thinking and to um, progress in their learning. So we've seen um, higher test scores and more homework being done and um, socialization. And when that occurs, then we have all kinds of growth in terms of learning. And finally, the importance of connecting with colleagues. The biggest form of uh, professional development is being able to have teachers work together and talk together. But in terms of learning lab, it's the best way that we can support our students to understand what is taking place in the different classrooms. Our learning lab teacher is responsible to work with students from, from all subjects, all grade levels. So that conversation, that dialogue uh, between our learning lab teacher as well as the classroom teacher just ensures that uh, you know our students are getting all the supports they can. If we want to support the whole child and support the student to the fullest, then those conversations need to take place. And again, it's the only way that there's knowledge on how to best support that child. So without those conversations taking place, um, you know, we won't be as effective as we are right now. So uh, just to continue, um, one of the things we wanted to highlight is uh, the district-wide services. And uh, many of you know that in this current year budget, we allocated about $3,036,000 in our general fund budget that's um, supporting our uh, actual, um, in this case, we're listing them, our salary and staff. And that's part of that cont uh, continuity of services. So you can see here in this grant, 
Uh, we're uh, providing the financial support for teachers, um, teachers, special education, summer school, um, teachers in the learning lab, uh, psychologists district-wide, guidance counselors, nurse services in summer school, aides in summer school. So again, these may not be full FTEs, but they're paid for in the grant, and that's how we're using that $3 million. Uh, and then additionally, um, many of the grant requirements have um, a portion that is for uh, supporting mental health. Uh, I'm not going to go over all these items, but with uh, Mr. Scanzuzo's help, we've defined all of these items that are very important for our students um, to move forward in the um, area of mental health. A lot of it's related to programs that are new. Some of them are programs that are co continuing. Staff development is included in this. Um, you can see some of those, which again, web and link crew training for more of our staff to um, provide more of those services to our students. Um, and, and a number of these items that really have uh, helped us move that area forward. And again, that's uh, in, in compliance with the grant requirements. So with that, um, we'll take any questions. And I just wanna, I, I'm sorry. Go right I just wanna ahead. thank you both uh, for putting this together with the support from Assistant Superintendent Scanzuzo. And this was in response to the many questions board members had about ESSER gear and gear funding, how it's being used in the district, if there's any changes, learning lab. And what's also important is what Dr. Balin said, having that chart on the website that parents are able to go to click on the link to get a definition of the supports or watch a presentation on the supports that had been done at a previous board meeting is very important too. So I just wanna say that's where this came from and I thank you very much for the presentation. Absolutely, I'll go to my left and then to my right. Any questions or comments on my left? All right, I'll start at the end and move down. What about this way? Well, oh, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, that's, Ms. kesmerick Bogner. Nothing personal. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to thank um, everyone for the presentation. We did have a lot of questions, and I think you answered all of my questions through this presentation, so I appreciate your time in putting this together, and also the time that it took to apply for all these grants separately, as you said, in some instances. So I just wanted to thank you for all the work and the time and effort in all this. Uh, I am so grateful for that piece in particular about learning labs. I've heard a lot of questions um, or from parents that were looking for help for their kids and didn't even know it existed. So uh, I appreciate the outline, both in the presentation and the video. Thank you for taking the time to do that because I think that will really help to illustrate what's available to children this year and, and next year, it seems, as well. Um, I went to the website to find the... Um, the chart with all the different pieces and it's wonderful. So thank you for putting that together. Um, my only suggestion would be just to ensure that that video is easily accessible because it looks like the learning lab takes to this presentation, mm -hmm. yeah. um, which I know about because I just watched it and I saw where the link is, um, but it's such great work. Um, I would hate for that to be lost. And so maybe just, or maybe it's there and I just didn't find it yet, but um, Sometimes Thank I think you. one click versus two or three, um, you'll get more views and and it's really just a, a nice, uh, and I also appreciate that it wasn't just in one school that you're showing across mm -hmm. um, the levels and it does that in the document beautifully too. Thank you so much, that's great. Thank you, and with Mr. Filipowski's help, maybe we can extract the video out and have that be its own standalone item too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Ms. Poulin or Dr. Littman? Oh, I, would just, I would just also say, say thank you. Um, I had many of the same questions and appreciate very much your answer. And the focus is this was targeted for a special need. So I, I think that's important for all of us to keep in mind. So thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. I'll continue the thank yous. Uh, and, and again, what I want to thank you for, and, and I'm happy to always see emphasize is student support for learning, because that's valuable, especially in the challenging times we've had over the last year or two or three or whatever. Uh, and the second part of that is the uh, increased support and focus on mental health, because we know that that's an important part of learning and having training for our faculty and staff and increased opportunities for our students to have supportive mental health is always of great value. So thank you. 
Anyone on my right? Vice President Van Slice. So I appreciate this very much. I know we did have a lot of questions, um, as mentioned. And just a couple notes that I had. Yes, COVID definitely made us recognize, acknowledge, and implement ways to better support the whole child. Mm -hmm. um, so this presentation is very welcomed. Um, we know that our children have gone through some losses on very different ways. Um, I am confident though, I truly feel confident that even without this funding, we will continue to provide these support services. Mm -hmm. One thing I am truly elated with is that we have heard, many of us have experienced, there was a time that in order to receive some assistance, we had to go outside of that school setting to receive that. This ensures that we're able to provide it within our own schools. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible because again, executive functioning, all of those other pieces are so important in the building of relationships that's happening in-house. So this is very pleasing to see. Awesome. Thank you. Anyone else? Just also a thank you, but not just for the presentation, but for um, putting it all together and having the pieces of the learning labs and everything. It's appreciated. Okay. Um, I just wanted to add that back in February, I believe it was February 3rd, Dr. Singh and I both attended, even though it was virtual, um, an event with Rick Timms. And his focus was on long range financial considerations, but he designated a significant portion of that training to all of the different grants mm -hmm. that were available through the pandemic. He, he went through all of them in much the same way that you did, Mr. Matursky. Um, and then he gave specific recommendations to school boards because mm -hmm. with all of that happening was new um, as school board members, you know, we weren't really sure what our role is, was in that. And how do we know whether or not the recommendation that's coming from the superintendent in the district mm -hmm. is one that we should be agreeing with and have it be in line with these grants. So some of the recommendations were to make sure that if you do hire staff, that you do so for the short range, mm -hmm. or if it's going to be a long-term position, that it's something that the budget can absorb in the future. Um, his primary uh, suggestions, though, were not to spend the majority on staff, mm -hmm. but to use it for programming and professional mentoring, so the different professional development opportunities. And those two items, the different programs and the different PD opportunities are real. I mean, you laid them all out there. And to me, I felt like, you know, what Dr. Singh and I participated in was evidence that our district was really just following it to a T as to like what those recommendations were for school board members. And then here in turn, we can see our district is following all of that. So that was several months ago back, and that made me feel very comfortable that we were doing the right thing as a district. So I just want to thank you for that. And also point out that, um, you know, there were some questions in the past from community about the use of our funds. So this presentation, I'm hopeful, will serve as a source of accurate information going forward, as well as right on our budget page. You can find the links to the FS10s. FS10s, which is the documents that were sent to the state, which you know repeat everything that you shared tonight. Mm -hmm. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Right. And now, oh, now I'll turn it back over to you, President Oliver. Okay, so I think we're on thirteen. Thirteen. So we're moving over to finance. Okay. I'm going to combine a few items here for items 13. May I please have a motion to resolve and approve the proposed 2023 budget, including the budget notice and property tax report card in 13A, internal audit risk assessment 13B, and the agreement for payment in lieu of taxes for the Jewish Federation Affordable Senior Housing Project at 275 SJ Road in 13C as presented. So 
we're combining all of our budget items tonight. Dr. McClary, thank you. And Vice President Van Slice is a second. Any final questions or comments on the proposed budget or any questions on beef? Mrs. Beeger. Yeah, I just want to comment for the public that um, we are not just rubber stamping this budget, that we have been over this budget and have received several mm -hmm. wonderful in-depth presentations from Mr. Matursky um, for months and months now. So um, for those that may be tuning into a board meeting for the first time, um, this is not something new to us. This is something that we have been over and asked several questions in depth um, several times. Thank you, Mrs. Beeger. We did have just recently on March 22nd, our budget. We sure meeting, did. Which was our last time that we visited this in depth. Any other questions or comments? None, all in favor? All hands up equals motion carries unanimously. Item 14, if you have any liaison reports, please send them to Mrs. Carey. The list of meeting dot dates are in board docs. Does anyone wish to report on a meeting or event that they recently attended? Jasmerick Bogner. I just wanted to mention at a recent PTA meeting that I went to um, the issue of technology and having Chromebooks for students came up. It seems like, although I believe most students at the high school level are aware of how to get Chromebooks and they can sign them out through the library for the year, that maybe that information hasn't gotten communicated to parents as clearly. So I, I just wondered if moving forward, we could consider somehow communicating that to parents, maybe in the beginning of the school year, so they're aware of the process. We will. We um, are actually going to put it in the weekly update this week, also weekend, this Friday also, and you know, in the what's being sent home. But we are going to have to find multiple modes of communication. So I know we've said it, many times and we've even presented it here and, and President Leatherborough has put an exclamation point behind it here also, but somehow there's still a disconnect. And I know that was brought up earlier uh, last week also. So we'll, we'll make sure we do a better job at communicating that so students and families know about the library loan program, the Chromebook loan program through the libraries and the high schools. Thank you. I'm wondering if it could even go in the um, school handbooks for mm -hmm. each of the high schools. Yeah because that is linked directly on, on the WITS page when you log on if your child is in high school. So maybe that's just another place that parents can look to. Because um, I, I think it was even a question at the community forum. It was one of the pre-submitted questions right. that we didn't get to. Mm -hmm. So with this late in the year, we hate to hear that that's still Correct. an issue for anyone. Um, anybody else wish to comment on a recent liaison event that they attended? We'll mention the... Yep. I will mention, so I did go to the KCPTSA meeting. Um, I think it was last week. I did my entire report, but as I think we know on WITS, it times out after a certain amount of time and doesn't save. <laughs> so when I got in the car and drove my son to an event and then went back to it, it didn't save. So I'm so sorry I didn't submit a report, but I was there. Awesome. <laughs> but the I just wanted to mention there is a PTSA leadership and training event that is going to be held Monday at Williamsville North at seven o'clock. So if anyone's watching, listening, and interested in joining their PTSA or is currently a member, you don't have to be part of the executive board for the PTSA at your school. You certainly can reach out to a PTSA executive, the president or vice president, or even show up. There's a link to register, um, but it's going to have Dr. Brown Hall and President Leatherbarrow will be there. They will be doing roundtables for elementary, middle school, high school. So it's a very informative way to, again, as you have already stated, to become involved and really understand your school, your PTSA, and the district better. And I just want to point out, I'm not the liaison at North, but I am a North parent. And I just want to thank you, Superintendent Brownhall, for attending Absolutely. the last PTA meeting at North. And just uh, sort of echo what you said earlier, because attending the PTA meetings is a really way to get the information straight from the source. Mm -hmm. And I go to hear directly from the principal, right? Um, because I just think that that's so important. Okay, anybody else? All right, item 15, does anyone have any legislative or curriculum matters to discuss? 
All right, thank you. 17, may I please have a motion to resolve and approve the home instructor's pay rate in 17A, the funding for the negotiated agreement between the superintendent and the Williamsville Coordinators Association in 17B, the funding for the contract of employment extensions for the assistant superintendent of instruction and the assistant superintendent of finance and management services in 17C, and the funding for the contract of employment for the assistant superintendent of human resources in 17D as presented. Thank you, Vice President Van Size, Board Member Poulin, thank you. As a second, are there any questions for discussion? All right, seeing none, all in favor? All hands up equals motion carries unanimously. And I'd like to thank our assistant superintendents for all of the fine work that you do. All right, we are on item 18. Mm -hmm. District Facilities and Support Services, Superintendent Brown Hall, I turn it over to you for a facility update. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. I'm going to ask Mr. Maturski just to give brief highlights. We're um, entering the security improvement phase, and as you know, over the spring break, there was some construction and demolition that already occurred. So Assistant Superintendent Maturski will speak to that very quickly, and if there's any questions. Yes, uh, again, we started our construction in earnest over the spring break. Um, we had construction going on at Country Parkway, uh, Mill Middle, uh, Heim Elementary and Forest Elementary, as well as North High School. Um, major work, uh, we started to do some of the roof work, not necessarily um, putting the roof on, but taking these concrete pavers off. That's a very labor-intensive process, and that happened at many of these schools, and you may see some of the safety barriers around um, them at this point in time. The other thing we began um, in earnest again at both um, Country Parkway, Mill Middle, and at Maple East is going into the security aspect of renovating their offices. So those buildings now um, will not be able to re go back to their offices until they're fully renovated, which is gonna be at the end of August, that's our plan. So a couple of them have portable trailers being uh, Mill Middle and um, Maple East. Um, the others were able to secure some space within the buildings. All in all, we had a very successful um, a process over the last week, uh, and everything is really back on track. Some of that work will be continuing at the uh, sites for those schools that have the security aspects going on between now and the end of the year, most likely on second shift. So again, a uh, really good start. Uh, we're in a good place right now, and we're hoping to meet our schedules, um, which would allow those spaces to all be done uh, by the time we return to school in September. Thank you very much. And I did notice um, there is information on the school security project on the business page, because I, I did see some questions uh, that popped up on our face on Facebook about, you know, why are why are we tearing down the front end of the buildings? <laughs> not random right. yeah, yeah. so <laughs> it, it was uh, approved by the voters in june of 2020 and there's um all the detailed information is available on our district website thank you very much yeah. mr Matursky. all right does anyone have anything to discuss for correspondence since nothing was submitted for committee of the whole i actually did submit something oh, for committee of the whole God. that's okay um I just wanted to mention a concern that I had brought up um, a few months ago when we were looking at student projections. Uh, time, I, I know it's difficult to look at projections, especially given what's happened with the pandemic the last couple of years. Uh, but one of my concerns at that time was that the firm that was looking at um, our student projections may not have been taking into account um, the development that's been happening in Amherst. And at that time, uh, I had expressed that concern and asked you, Dr. Brown Hall, if, if there might be um, some way that, or, or if the board, the, our district was working with the town just to stay up to date with exactly what's happening. Since that time, uh, I've seen a lot more trees go down, sadly. And where my real concern is, is the schools and the reports that we've seen, the Himes and North High School that really have high population of students. And even without the development figures 
um, were projected to go higher. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, where are we as far as looking at what that means? Do we know, is there a, a relationship between the district and the town? And um, how are we being proactive so that we know what this means as far as if we can expect an increase in student population more so than what we were shared at uh, the beginning of our school year? Absolutely. And so we are working with the town to get more updated information to see if these developments are student housing, senior housing, or if they're residential, you know, and they're going to appeal to families that are going to have um, students, you know, potentially. And I know information was shared by uh board member Kazmarek Wagner also about one of the developments and it does look like these are residential homes three four five bedroom you know and those homes do attract families with children but what we're also doing we're looking to see if we can get better enrollment projections if not from the current group from another group so that we can better anticipate what our enrollment in our schools will look like and making sure that they take into account what the developments are and what type of housing so that we have you know future projections that are more accurate and give us a better picture i know there was also a suggestion that maybe we try to do some of that stuff in-house and i wouldn't want to ask our staff because none of us really have that specialty right because it is a special science to be able to project enrollments and what that looks like so it's better that we do go with an outside company that has expertise in that and then can take the information from the amherst town board and really figure that in into what our enrollment projections will look like Perfect. I'm so glad to hear about that enhancement, looking for a company that can help us to mm -hmm. see the whole big picture and that work with the town. So that's great. Thank you, Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Mrs. Degar. Does anyone have any um, correspondence they wish to share? All right. I just want to mention there were a few, I think there were two letters that came in during the spring recess. So I was away last week and I will be answering them um, by Friday. Um, all right, I guess we are ready to go back to executive session. So at this time, may I have a motion to adjourn into executive session to discuss current litigation and employment matters related to particular persons. Thank you, board member Poulin. May I have a second? Vice President Van Sice. thank you. All in favor? Thank you, all hands up equals motion carries unanimously. Mm -hmm. yes, yes.